Good day. Welcome to What I Wish I Knew. At Vericent, we strive to have meaningful conversations on topics that leaders and sales professionals, people just like you, want to know about and care about. In this series, we are excited to talk to industry leaders so they can share their experiences and insights with all of you. I'm super pumped. We have Bettina Kamermer with us today. She is sales compensation guru, helping companies specifically in EMEA to um, optimize their sales comp strategy and execution. Um, thank you so much for being here, Bettina. Thank you for having me. I'm, so, I'm excited about the conversation we are about to have. Thank you. So today um, we are gonna be talking about EMEA specifically. Um, we're gonna talk about the business implications of market disruptions. We are going to talk about the strategies companies are leveraging. Uh, and also some of the strategies they should be leveraging. Um, and then what's around the corner for business related to sales comp? So what, what should they be looking into and considering as they build their plan? So let's get into it, Bettina. The one thing I will say for anybody who is here, um, folks listening, please feel free to pop questions in the chat and we'll get to them towards the end of the session. So let's get to it, Bettina. Um, so. Someone who's worked with customers internationally, focused in EMEA, tell me a little bit of the key trends that make EMEA a unique market in which to do business. Um, there are a couple of factors. Um, in, in Europe, we are in EMEA, we have like a diverse culture. We have many languages. Um, the, the labor laws are different in, in the, any country. Um, the regulatory environment is, is is very high up there, so we have a lot of GDPR and any other regulations. Um, yeah, they vary by, by country. By so, if you take Saudi Arabia for example, they do not allow any any cloud setup outside of Saudi Arabian environment, and these kind of things. Yeah, so we also have like like to deal with a lot of. Um, at the moment, wars and, and other um, economic dis, 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 disparities. Mm -hmm. So if you take the Ukraine war, that's, that has a huge impact on, on, on doing business. Um, Israel, Gaza, that has an impact. Um, Sudan, all these kind of things um, have an impact on how and how we can do business, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it sounds like if you're not familiar with the European landscape, it is fraught with obstacles and and um, hiccups, right? Because you can easily get into regulatory problems and without a without an understanding of the nuance by country, not just region, um, you're you're kind of putting yourself in danger if you don't if you aren't led by an expert. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that um, is on a lot of people's minds is digital transformation. So certainly over the past 10 years, it, it's been the thing that people are talking about is digital transformation. So how are you seeing that the adoption of, of transforming, digitizing processes vary across the region? So in some countries, digital transformation is extremely slow. One of the countries being Germany. Uh, the EMEA regions, yeah, like many others, has been undergoing significant digital transformation. Um, yeah, but as I said, some countries are relatively slow to it. Um, there needs to be a lot of persuasion work to be done. Um, and some companies that fail to adapt to these changes risk being left behind in a rapidly evolving marketplace. So if you're not, if you're not part of it now, then you will be losing out. That's a fact. Yeah, so this is this also is a theme that we hear again and again. It's um, one of my favorite quotes. I worked at Gartner for a couple of years. One of my favorite quotes is that technology is never going to move as slowly as it moves today. And that was before AI was everywhere. Mm. So in EMEA, despite um, or in addition to the, the slow adoption of digital transformation, what other kind of um, market disruptions have you seen as a professional and specifically with your clients? Um, yeah, so, so many, as I said, there is, there is a war, there is, um, uh, there is a policy or like a, like a behavior now where when salespeople don't hit their quotas, they don't believe that they want to stay there. 
the loyalty impact has been changed a lot over the years, especially also during during the pandemic. Uh, people have learned to um, be look more after themselves than they did before. So loyalty to the employer and that that's a big factor. And um, yes, salespeople or yeah anyone. Um, who do not feel treated nicely by the company, they will look for for going somewhere else mm -hmm. because there is a, there is a lack in skilled workers in in EMEA. I don't know how it is in the US, but here there are so many programs trying to educate people to become skilled workers in any profession um, or hire them from outside. So if you are a skilled worker, the world's your oyster. You can go anywhere. Yeah, it's, um, I think, you know, directly during COVID, those couple of years, they were calling it the great resignation, right? So it's where people were leaving en masse, um, especially in Canada, there were, um, there, there were, there was the opportunity for people to try different things, try different educations, that kind of thing. But certainly um, it's flip-flopped a little more in North America, I think, where there's now an influx. So perhaps it's, it's a little bit, um, ahead of what's happening in Europe, um, where there's an influx of really qualified people who may have resigned a year or two ago, and now they're looking for similar or upgrades in their jobs. Mm. Yeah, um, definitely. But I loved what you said regarding, you know, people are less loyal to the company and more aware of kind of what's in it for me. I think that was always a little bit the, the deal with sales reps. But if loyalty is waning among sales reps more than it used to be, boy, are we in for a change, right? So how is this impact companies specifically in EMEA? So they are looking at um, changing some of their approaches to how they treat their, their staff in general, but also um, especially with the salespeople they need to offer also non-monetary um, um, yeah ad additions to to the to the to the sales compensation um, and that can be a career development plan or that can be flexible working that can be top performer talent or top talent uh, programs all these kind of things where people are not only looking at their monthly paycheck but they also look like um, look at stuff. How what other benefits do I get other than pension and healthcare and so on? But like flexible working in, in Germany or in, in the UK is a big thing. Um, there is a so in the UK we have the Channel Islands. They have a specific program for their staff to um, enjoy the islands. Huh? So. Um, <laughs> Ah, that sounds great. <laughs> the only negative is that you need to be born there or there are very, very specific restricted visa regulations uh, to be able to, to, to work there. But um, it's a, it's a, it's a, when I thought about it, I, I thought like, that's actually a really good idea to like, um, when, there, when it's like summer or something, why not, um, I don't know, allow your safe people to go an hour earlier or something. Yeah. So if the, as long as the work is done, um, you're good, yeah? So, and I yeah, think so. that it would be done anyhow, yeah. I, I think that's a really interesting point because um, whereas I think sales reps specifically have always wanted um, flexibility and cash, like those were the two motivators, at least mm -hmm. when I was a seller, that was certainly a motivator for me is kind of lifestyle flexibility and the upside of making money for whatever you sold. Um, but I think the rest of the workforce outside of sales is now looking at the bigger picture. So I think you're right. I think that this pandemic, this shakeup of how people um, approach their work-life balance and also the yeah. type of work they're doing. I think it took this time for people to take a pause and say, is this actually what I want to do? What do I, what do I want to do for career planning? So I love that, um, you know, the impact is companies have to look a little more holistically at how they're approaching their teams. Um, yeah. So specific to sales comp and selling. So, you know, we've got this broader vision of creating a culture and improving employee satisfaction, which is all the things we've talked about. 
specific to sales leaders, how are they solving the problem or how are they approaching? I wouldn't say solving the problem because it's, I think it's still a problem. What's the approach that they're taking to manage this reduction in loyalty, um, this increase in turnover, the reduction in quota um, achievement? So they, as I, as I mentioned before, they do look into programs um, to revamp their approach to selling. So they need to look into, are my sales folks still up to date when it comes to technology, when it comes to training, does when it comes to um, how to use technology, social media and all of it. Yeah, so um, they, they need to look into, yeah, the, the learning of their sales um, teams, the skill set and, and all these kind of things. And then they need to look into like, am I treating my people right? And is my market data still still um, valid? So um, during the energy crisis, a lot have, a lot has changed when it comes to that. Yeah. So, and what I find often is that people, when companies buy market data, they don't buy specific market data for their industry, but it's it. It, it, it can be other industries which have randomly something to do with with, with their business trait. But um, I always give the advice to, to my clients that if you buy market data, look specifically for market data that is really relevant for your area. And don't be afraid to, to go to Glassdoor or other things. Yeah? So there's, there's stuff outside. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is um, seek professional advice when you do these, these things because um, an external... Um, an expert can can see things that you might be blind f- from seeing because you're doing it in a day in and day out, yeah. So, and, or you have a spe- specific focus that might not be relevant anymore in this this uh, areas. And the other thing that um, there is a lot of money left on the table because companies are not looking into their cross selling ups- upselling um, opportunities. They don't do a proper analysis on their client base, on their ex- existing client base, because this has also, also changed. A lot of companies have merged or they have now additional business or they do diff- diff- a business a different way. Um, you need to look always into your existing customer base, how they have changed. And that gives you opportunities to then go back in there and say like, look, we've seen that you have now additional, you'll be merged with that company we have an idea on how we extend our business relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, what's interesting about that is that companies are so often looking inward about the changes that they're making and how they have to evolve it as a business, but aren't necessarily looking at the other side of the coin, which is our clients are changing just as much as we are. Our clients are looking to change and evolve just as much as we are. So looking at outdated data um, is a great example that you're, you know, it's it's stale. It doesn't fit anymore. Um, we have this um, case study here at Barisant where there was this customer who was, um, they felt like their market had been tapped out. So they had, uh, you know, their, their big number of clients. They had what they thought was their ideal customer profile. And so they were chasing these deals and they were not growing. In fact, they were shrinking year over year. Um, once they implemented artificial intelligence and aggregated all of their data, they were able to see um, not only buyer intent, but it was based on historical success. So deals that they could win faster, new verticals that they'd never considered before, company sizes that they had factors out outside of their ideal customer profile. And they identified tens of millions of dollars of opportunity where they thought there was none. So yeah. I think that that hits home the fact that you need relevant data and also you need a smart way to bring it all together and to, to mine it. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so I, I loved so much of what you just said. I think I wrote down everything. So it's <laughs> there's hard. also one other, other tip I always give is like, um, so let's say you have, have a customer and you work with this buyer, especially well, and he's now switching companies. That means you need to follow him. Yeah, mm-hmm. so he need, do not need to follow you. You need to follow him. Yeah, so you need to be um, looking at his LinkedIn profile and, and oh, he's there now. Do your own work. Reach out to him and say like, oh, do you remember we had this fantastic relationship? 
Um, is there anything that I can help you with in your new job? <laughs> yeah, I have the perfect <laughs> solution that you already know and love. Um, yes. It's like sales 101, right? Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, so, so as we think about all the things that are changing, and you talked about some really, um, I keep on calling things low-hanging fruit, but you know, cross-selling to me is low-hanging fruit. Um, that being said, I think that applies when companies are now forced to continue to increase revenue, but there's more pressure on spending. There's more restrictions and watchful eyes on spending. And so there's this sell more, perform better, but with the exact tools and people you've got. So some stats here, 28% of sellers were expected to hit quota in 2023, according to the Salesforce report, compared to the same period of time in 2022 was 53%. So massive, um, massive drop. And we... I wanted to see what your take was. What do you think the impact is on the sales floor of this massive disruption and this, um, this perception of I'm in it for me, um, this, this like searching now for companies who provide more? What do you think the sales reps are thinking and saying on the floor? Um, a lot of them will be thinking which industry still pays um, them the numbers. Like pharma, for example, yeah. So no change in in, in so they there there's still money there, yeah. So um, they look into going into industries where they can still get the money, or mm -hmm. they look for other things, yeah. So what other career um development opportunities do I have, yeah? So um, what what is important for me? The company where I work now, where I have like a medium income. Um, are they challenging me enough? Yeah, you know, salespeople do like to be challenged, the good ones. Yeah, so um, they like to have competitions, they like to have um, rewards, all these kind of things. Or am I going home at at five o'clock and play with my kids? Yeah, so um, and I'm 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 fine with my income. So um, that last example is very bad for the company because you have someone who's just doing everything in a very uh low level yeah so he will not be a, a top performer so um as a company you need to think about how can i attract top talent how can i retain my top talent and as an employee you will need to think um is there anything that i can do in my existing job to to push harder and get to that and um if you are not hitting your numbers year after year after year the loyalty to the company will go down again because they don't trust your quota setting abilities. They don't trust your go-to-market strategy and they don't trust your quota setting abilities. They also think like, you're you're cheating on me. My total target in compensation should be X. But as you are never, as I never been able in the past, well, I don't know, three, four or five years to hit the number, I'm never, I'm never at that level. So are you trying to, to, to cheat on me? So um, there, are, there are a couple of things that companies can do um, better with the existing technology and staff and so on, but they should try really to keep up with the trends. And if they, if they use old technology, um, change it. There is so much stuff out there now that makes your life so much easier which is fast, um, agile, and so on, and might even be not so expensive than you think it is expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, you know, having having a really solid way to show value is important, both as the seller and as the buyer of technology. And I, and I think about, you know, as we look at the stats, this decline from 53% quota achievement to 28% quota achievement, um, I, as a former seller, that sounds terrifying, right? So the looking mm -hmm. around, none of my peers are making plan. Um, and I and I think that you hit the nail on the head when you said it's not just about the the micro approach to your territory, your quota. It's what is this company doing? How are they setting these targets? Am I am I hitching my wagon to the right horse? If they're doing the peanut butter spread 
quota increase, everybody gets 5%. Or if you're a top performer, they give you 20%. And the the low performer is rewarded with a 3% increase. So um, I think it's an interesting thing, uh, an interesting approach to look look at the employee, how they're feeling, what the market is demanding to um, to attract good quality people, to retain your quality people. Um, so when we talk about, you know, creating this positive culture and a holistic, um, a, holist- a holistic reward system or an attractive package, if you will, when we think about how companies can show investment back in their sales teams, what do you think that that might look like? Or what recommendations have you given to companies that, um, you know, may not be in the most attractive of industries, may not be in the highest paying industries? What are the kinds of things they can do with their sellers? Um, I would say um, bring some fun to the floor. So um, people like to have a good time. And that can be very simple, like pub night out, um, some fancy fancy stuff with when we have uh, team calls, video calls, um, have it under under a theme, um, regular meetups, yeah. So on, on fun locations, like I don't know a picnic in the park, these kind of things, yeah. So you don't need to go to Disneyland with everyone, yeah. So <laughs> that would be okay. So you can, yeah, but you can do cheaper things, yeah, which are as as much fun as as anything, yeah. So um. I would say it also depends on if you have like a, a a team only in one country or if you're spread all over. Yeah, so if you're spread all over, you can you can find a location that is less expensive, like let's say London or or Munich or these big cities. Yeah, so you can find a location that is fun but but less expensive. And if you are um, in an industry that is not um, sexy, yeah, or not 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 that attractive um then yeah make it make it attra- attractive there's one of my clients they were a um electronic truck um manufacturer I'm just, would there be anything um fancy about this yes i mean they made a lot of uh, funny videos and um the truck showed up and yeah so everywhere where you were not expecting it and so on yeah so it was yeah it, it, Mm-hmm. Fun way to just um, promote what they were doing and involve their their staff also. Yeah. So um, the other thing is that I would recommend is um, involve your, your 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 staff. Yeah. So you could do like um, like a like a like if you have a new product or something, let them come up with names. Yeah. So um, all these kind of things. Yeah. Cost you nothing. I mean, you even save on the big agency fees for coming up with a name. Yeah. So um, I work for a company, Niku, and their main product was named by one of the employees who won then a trip to, I don't know, Miami or something. Yeah. So um, amazing. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. And I, and I think a part two, you know, as I think about the employees who are disenfranchised, who feel disconnected from the broader strategy, um, something you and I have talked about too is, is, bringing employees into the fold of the communication. So as decisions are being made um, on quotas and territories and sales plans, um, as things change, involving the employees in that and communicating in a variety of different ways. Um, because I, some of the reports I've read indicate that now more than ever, people want to feel like they're a part, even if we're mm-hmm. virtual. So they want to be a part of um, they want to be more involved with the decisions. And they so, want to be looped in when there is something made, or some decision that have been made, they want to be looped in. Yeah. So, um, they have voice now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so I, I think that that's really important too, as a part of creating strategy. So employees can then get, um, confidence back in the go-to-market strategy. Definitely. And, um, if you don't tell them what you want from them and or how you reached quotas or territories and these kind of thing, they will they will never be able to deliver because they don't know what is what the ask is. They will make it up in their own mind what they think is the ask, but it might not be a match to what the company really wants them to do. Mm-hmm. For for everyone who has children, 
um, your kid might have gone through a phase where you were saying, clean up your room and they were saying, why? Yeah, you say like, um, eat your, 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 your piece. They say, why? Yeah, so um, this, this, you can revert back to like, um, remember your kid when it was asking all these why questions. Mm -hmm. The salesperson, they are grown up now. They are, don't ask all these why questions anymore, but they still want to know the purpose of what you're doing. And if you don't have anything to hide, you can be transparent with your with your folks, not only the salespeople, um, who is everyone basically. And it's explain to you what the strategy is, why you reached certain decisions, what the thought process behind it. Yeah, I remember as a sales rep, I I always felt empowered when I was able to talk to my clients about the corporate mission and you know mm -hmm. why we're making certain product decisions or investments and leading in at different places. Um, so realizing we are zipping through time and there's not much left. I wanted to ask this last question because it has been a topic of discussion um, with several of my other guests and it was about managing an approach to managing disruption and market instability with more frequent planning cycles with shorter quote, shorter quota cycles as a way to become more agile and responsive versus, you know, COVID-19 hits in February you've got the rest of your fiscal year and everybody's in panic. Um, what if you were able to plan more regularly? So tell me a little bit about that and how a company might be able to start doing this on the right foot. Yeah. So I would say that the trend to plan for an entire year um, is going down. Yeah. So there are so many things happening throughout the plan year that you can't foresee like the wars and these kind of things that disrupt your business so um and di disrupt it in a way that you need to adjust quotas using shorter cycles like semi-annual sales plans basically for example um mean that you have an approved responsiveness you have advanced and enhanced accuracy you have um flexibility and adaptability to the to the current plan and you don't need to adjust your your old plan basically and you have a better resource allocation so because you're planning only for six months and not for an entire year you can oversee the the periods better so um which means that you streamline your processes um mm -hmm. and these kind of things yeah so it's it's just um it, it will help companies to be more on plan so your 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 28 percent number should be going up to 85 90 something like that yeah and i and you know i was talking with one of my enterprise sales rep associates last week and he was saying that some of his clients are moving to semi-annual planning but the enterprise folks are um, struggling a little bit with that because the question is, you know, I've got a sales cycle that's 18 months long. Does it make sense for me to have a six month quota? Maybe or maybe not. But I think the important thing is um, having the technology that can enable you to create different types of plans um, that might renew at different type at, at different times rather. Um, yeah. So I think one of the things we talked about too is kind of enabling technology um, because I think a lot of companies look at sales planning and think like, holy moly, I cannot possibly do this twice a year, three times a year. It takes me six months to get the annual plan in place. So the, the, um, so the, the, the point is um, on this one, as you're going through this um, shorter planning cycle, also your planning work is less because you, you, you need to just make sure that everything is lined up constantly your forecasting is lined up all the time you do you need to do monthly or quarterly review processes of everything the performance of your sales people the performance of the products the performance of the clients uh, your forecast accuracy and these kind of things when 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 you have all your ducks in a row then um that means that it is easier for you to to do this proper planning because it does not come as a surprise. Yeah. So, I, I surprise I think that's a good point. Well, I, I actually like, as we're talking through it, I envision 
you know, quarterly or semi-annual planning makes you much more efficient, but also you constantly have a better finger on the pulse of how the business is progressing through the year. So I think there's tons of benefits to more regular planning. Um, If you can imagine it, we are through this chunk. We're going to move to quick questions, but first I wanted to share with you some of the key takeaways I had. Um, The first one that I, I think I recapped already is the fact that employee sentiment, seller sentiment is changing. They want more flexibility. They want a bigger, um, more holistic package. So they want to feel like they're a part of a culture. They want to feel like there's a plan for them individually. So that leads to the second thing, which is organizations have to start offering something more attractive to attract and retain those high quality people. Um, The third thing that I think is made clear that we didn't talk about really, but that has been made clear is that having an expert guide, specifically where, when you're in a regional place, just like EMEA, having an expert guide to navigate different nuances in different regions and um, different cultures is so important. Um, And the fourth thing that I'll add is that technology to enable agility, um, is something that can elevate and accelerate performance um, for companies in the face of this crazy market disruption we're in the middle of. So those are my takeaways, but now I have quick questions. All right, Tip, I'm ready. Here we go. So what is one piece of advice you have for sellers who are starting out? I would say never end your day without uh, taking at least one proactive step to put prospective business at the top of your sales funnel. That means making one call, asking for one referral, sending a letter, an email, or going to a networking event. Ooh, good one. People don't go to networking events. Um, Who is one mentor you really look up to? Um, that would be Chris Mashing. She is um, she she she's been my coach um, for a while, and um, she's unfortunately about to retire. But uh, she, she lives in the U.S. and she's the greatest person you can ever have a conversation with. Oh, amazing! Um, on a personal note, what was your very first job? I was packing shelves in a supermarket and put price labels on it. I did that when I was five years old. It was one of my favorite things to do, but I never did it for work. Maybe it's like, do what you love. Um, Finally, uh, what are some um, sales performance management myths you've heard? How did you discover they weren't true? Maybe one or two. Um, So SPM software is only beneficial for large enterprises. So that's that's a myth. So large enterprises, of course, can benefit, but... um, I would say when you reach the number of 50 sales headcount, that's the moment when the latest you should invest into proper technology and move away from Excel, hands off from Excel. Yeah, so um, 50 is the the, the magic number. Um, you, you can also move to um, technology when you have only 10 people, but um, 50 is really the breaking point. Anything thereafter is too late. Okay. Um- to wrap up this What I Wish I Knew episode, tell me what you wish you knew more about. I would like to get companies or more companies to use sales compensation the way it should be used and get companies to use SPM solutions instead of Excel. <laughs> Isn't that all of our mission? Well, <laughs> thank you so much, Tina. Um, I really value the conversation we had today the perspective that is unique to the EMEA view, but also so many of your thoughts are um, globally applied, not just specific to EMEA. So again, thank you. Thank you so much for being here today and for the rest of everyone. We'll see you next time.